So the journal is right to uh, point out the impertinences, insolences, satire and, quote, dull jokes aimed at the magazine. So a significant part of the contemporary response to phrenology came in the form of satire. So there is a very famous um, kind of portrayal, the portrayal of Mr. Cranium in Thomas Love Peacock's Headlong Hall is but one, perhaps the earliest, of a large body of satirical reposts to phrenology from Isaac Disraeli's An Essay on Skulls of 1805 through to Cruikshank's Phrenological Illustrations, uh, first published in 1826, and a large body of poetry, uh, satirical poetry and humorous illustration. So satirical opponents of phrenology most commonly lambasted for its physiological determinism, its denial of free will, its pseudo-scientific journal. And of course, it being foreign only adds to the mirth, with the phrenologist betrayed, to use Brackwood's phrase, as a crack-brained German theorist. Okay? So peddling crude and reductive explanations for human diversity. So as the, uh, the late um, scientific author Roger Cooter has written, phrenology was greeted by a, a chorus of jeers from scientists and satirists alike. He says this, phrenology was often seen as pseudo-scientific and pseudo-philosophical. In one of the earliest notices in the Monthly Review in 1802, a lasting precedent was set with the dismissal of the science as visionary. Okay? So lots of journals shared the view that phrenology was spread by gullible and harebrained enthusiasts who appealed only to the simple-minded, the eccentric and the, the foolish. So some of the sternest attacks on phrenology and some of the funniest satire on, in, uh, on phrenology as ever in the Blackwoods, uh, in the Romantic period, is to be found in Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine. Blackwood's did not mince words. Fool and phrenologist are terms nearly synonymous, it writes in 1823. So from its foundation in the summer of 1817, Blackwood's carried animadversions on phrenology. The very first number of May 1817 contains an essay written by A.M. called the craniological controversy, some observation on the late pamphlets of Dr. Gordon and Dr. Spurtsign. And these observations in Blackwood's issue one see phrenolo uh, phrenology as, a, as merely a passing fancy, a kind of epiphenomenal fancy, a whim of the, the people who have got nothing better to do. Craniology has almost outlived its little hour. In this city of Edinburgh, we are certain, with the absence of Dr. Spurzheim, who has now departed to Germany, and the introduction of some other novelty, say a French dance or a, a new beauty, it will no longer be the fashion of the age and will be very soon forgotten. There is nothing which can make us regret the fall of this dim-witted and ill-fated system. And from its early days, Blackwood's also carried satire on phrenology, as in its essay, uh, its comic essay called Nosology, a dissertation <laughs> on the intellectual faculties, as manifested by the various configurations of the nose, which is a parody <coughs> of phrenology. So inevitably, Blackwood's, which was characterised throughout by vituperative ad hominem to the person, uh, personal satire, attacked phrenology. So throughout the first 15 years of the magazine, we see constant satire and nose-thumbing and, and, and sneering at phrenology. So for example, from May 1818 onwards, the journal, courtesy of J.G. Lockett, who of course was fluent in German, in German, in, in Germany, uh, in German and was a, was, a, was a great Germanist, uh, an admirer of Kant, and no, you know, no, no, no Philistine. Uh, he actually wrote a series of parodies in Blackwood's Blackwoods is pleased to announce our own craniological correspondent, Dr. Ulrich Sternstair, who is a, a learned German and clearly is a thinly veiled version of Spurzheim. So uh, Dr. Ulrich Sternstair in uh, penned a series of, uh, of letters on phrenology in the early issues of the magazine. So the craniologist's reviews and the letters on the national characteristics of the Scots. 
So, for example, in the Scots letters, Stern's there declares, I suppose I should put on a kind of cod German accent. Go on, John. <laughs> the superb collection of skulls which I have been accumulating in reference to the German characteristics is increasing every day. But a covenant, I'll give that up now, but a covenant <laughs> is yet required to form the apex of the pyramid. Meanwhile, I must content myself with collecting whatever specimens I can find. I have long had an eye upon an old Scottish snuff dealer in London whose head contains some remarkable points. He is now, I am pleased to say, in his last illness, and I soon expect to see him here in the dissection room. <laughs> If you then think curious, be so good as to transmit it to me, whether dead in a glass case, or alive with a letter of introduction. No specimen, I assure you, will ever suspect that I am taking a look of him. So such raillery becomes a key part of the Blackwoods armoury, as the phrenologists well knew. So the introductory statement of the phrenological journal characterises the ignoble methods used by its journalistic <coughs> opponents, their use of mockery, raillery, satire, and dull jokes. So instead of engaging in, in logical, uh, reasoned arguments, says the, the phrenological uh, magazine, Blackwood's Edinburgh magazine relies only upon raillery and abuse, falsehood and malignity, impertinence and insolences, wretched jokes and indecencies, nastinesses and brutalities. Makes you want to read the magazine, does it not? <laughs> the latter, uh, the, the, the classic plague of Blackwoods. Okay, deeply ironic. So Blackwoods, of course, took no notice whatsoever. So the craniological review of Ulrich Sternster, in a true German manner, sees Sternster offering his thoughts on the heads of various historical and contemporary notables. So Cromwell and Voltaire and Napoleon are analysed by Ulrich Sternstein. So Sternstein writes of Napoleon that thus, in the upper back part of his head, we find an excessive expansion of self-love. There is imperfect development of the organs of veneration in the lateral organs which surround the table at the top of his head. However, I find Napoleon a more amiable character than that vile toad, Frederick of Prussia, who had no moral faculties on the top of his head. So that's the, that's the parody. If you compare this with the real writings of George Coombe, there isn't a great deal of difference. So this is, uh, this is Coombe's analysis of the Emperor Napoleon, written in 1825. The student of phrenology will find much, to add to, to, sorry, much of interest in the mask of Napoleon. With those men of average talents, he will discover in Napoleon the extraordinary length of the zygomatic arch, indicating the large size of the anterior lobe of the brain, which are always evident in men of great powers. So, Blackwoods continues the assault in the May 1819 satirical essay on nosology, which is a, a, a dissertation on the intellectual faculties as manifested by these various configurations of the nose. So the nose being visible to all, Nodology, says Blackwoods, has many key advantages over its rival science. With all due deference to craniology, the present forms of politeness forbid the freedom of handling the skulls of others in search of the development of their organs. So instead, you can look at someone's nose and determine their character. So it's a new kind of post-Sternian, Slorkenbergian science which draws, which draws its example on the noses of the great. So, a convex apex of the nose is indicative of courage. Thus, the personal valour of the Duke of Wellington is exampled in the projective character of his nose. So, uh, nosology also targets the analogical method, whereby, to borrow Skirtsheim's phrase, the brain of the lower animals can be compared with the human brain. We'll hear more about that in a minute, by the reflected light of analogy. So, according to nosology, Quote, a nose forming a right angle at the base is also a, a negative characteristic, indicating cupidity and curiosity. In elucidating this proposition, we shall address the analogies of various inquisitive animals. The sharp-nosed fox prying into a hen roost combines curiosity with cupidity. Similarly, human docility 
is in proportion to nasal flexibility. And here we shall again draw our inferences from the brute creation. The extreme docility of the elephant can only be attributed to the wonderful flexibility of his proboscis. And the rhinoceros determines his belligerent and stubborn character from the inflexible snout <laughs> surmounted by a horn. So Blackwoods returns to the attack in 1821, in August. The Essays on Cranioscopy, Phrenology and, cr uh, and Craniology by Sir Toby Tickletoby Bart. Uh, and Tickletoby, <laughs> like the nosologist before him, proposes a new physiological science, which instead of uh, the analysis of the head, on the analysis of the, of, of, of the buttocks. So, this draws, says backwards, on the practical researches of the learned schoolmaster, Mr. Edward Clister, who has made repeated examination of the bottoms of nearly 800 boys while headmaster of the grammar school of Kinkle Harty. So caning these posteriors, discovers Mr. Clister, tends to stimulate the intellectual powers of the boys concerned. As a consequence, it must follow that the bottom is more intimately connected with the mind than preceding investigators and scientists have ever supposed. So Tickle Toby offers a marvellously kind of swifty and uh, modest proposal, arguing that the soft heads of, instant, of infants who, are, who demonstrated uh, unpromising bumps might be refashioned into a more agreeable shape. I quote, As all the organs of thought and volition are distinctly laid down in the cranial map, and given the practicality of compressing the cranial bones at an early age, nothing more is required than to mould an infant's head to a given form, by the simple application of an unyielding metal headdress, formed so as to permit the development of the required organs. So this procedure, at a stroke, can solve the problems of war, famine and crime. Thus, by repressing the bump of furtiveness, the causes of crime would instantly be done away with. Allow not the organs of destructiveness and combat and combativeness to expand, and war and ruin will be banished from the land. When the means of subsistence becomes too scanty for the existing population, let the organs of amativeness, the back of your head, and phyloprogenitiveness have no room for display. And the next generation would live and die in celibacy. Okay? Now, splendid as this might be, it should be noted that the game of reductio ad absurdum is not very easy to play with phrenologists. So Richard Gregory, in his uh, Oxford Companion to the Mind, points out that several 19th century phrenologists uh, uh, practically advocated the reshaping of the soft uh, skull of an, instant, of an infant into more propitious shapes. And Tickle Toady concludes, and I'll conclude my section of the paper, by arguing as follows. My chief objection to phrenology is that it does not go far enough. <laughs> For instance, we know that there are dull, stupid, and even insane people in the world. Yet there is no organ of stupidity or bump of dullness, no ridge or depression to designate the sane from the insane, the crack brain theorist from the cool investigator. However, there must be tremendous bumps of folly and gullibility. Gullibilitiveness, I believe, should be the words. Spurzheim and his followers offer abundant proof. So here, as ever, Blackwoods is setting its face against uh, German phrenology. Okay, so I'll move from the attack on phrenology to the case of Burke and Hare. <laughs>